evening. And thank you for joining us tonight at our Brooklyn talk with Amy Sherrill, Kehinde Wiley, and Doreen St. Felix. I'm Eugene Tsai, the John and Barbara Vogelstein Senior Curator of Contemporary Art and the co-curator of the Brooklyn Museum's presentation of the Obama Portraits with Jane Deeney, Andrew W. Mellon, Senior Curator of American Art. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are currently located on the land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Nation. We recognize and honor the Lenape nations, their elders, and all future generations. At the museum, we are committed toward addressing exclusions and erasures of indigenous people in our collective work and confronting ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Now for a few access notes. Kathleen Taylor and Candace Davider are interpreting today's talk. We have reserved seats in the front rows for anyone who would like a direct view of our ASL interpreters. It is my honor to welcome you today to today's conversations organized in conjunction with our special exhibition, The Obama Portraits. From the moment of their unveiling at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, Washington, D.C. in February 2018, the official portraits of President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama are, have become cultural icons. Kehinde Wiley's portrait of President Obama and Amy Sherald's portrait of the former First Lady have inspired unprecedented responses from the public. Eugenie? We're incredibly lucky tonight to have the two artists, Amy Sherald and Kahinde Wiley, here with us. They will be joined on stage with Doreen St. Felix. So I'll just take a moment for brief introductions. Born in Columbus, Georgia, and now based in the New York City area, Amy Sherald documents contemporary African American experience in the US through arresting and otherworldly figurative paintings. Cheryl engages with the history of photography and portraiture to tease out unexpected narratives. She invites viewers to participate in a more complex debate about accepted notions of race and representation and to situate black heritage centrally in American art. Los Angeles native and Brooklyn-based artist Kehinde Wiley has firmly situated himself within the European art historical tradition of monumental portrait painting. As a contemporary descendant of a long line of portraitists, including Titian, Reynolds, Gainsborough, and David, among others, Wiley engages the signs and visual rhetoric of power in his rep representations of black and brown individuals throughout the world. Doreen St. Felix has been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2017 and was named the magazine's television critic in 2019. Previously, she was a culture writer at MTV News. Her writing has appeared in The Times Magazine, New York, Vogue, The Fader, and Pitchfork. In 2017, she was a finalist for a National Magazine Award for Columns and Commentary, and in 2019, she won in the same category. After the conversation, there will be time for audience Q&A, so start thinking. Um, and after the program, we'll be selling prints, T-shirts, and copies of the exhibition catalogs on stage. I think you can see a little table over there. There will be so much brilliance on the stage this evening, so please help us in welcoming Amy Sherald, Kehinde Wiley, and Doreen St. Felix. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. 
Um, I'm Doreen, the moderator, and I'd like to start off with a fairly simple question. Both of you do portraiture, and I want to know what moved you to choose that as your practice? Well, I say that because I was born in 1973 and there was no computers, I grew up with Radio Shack, Tandy 2000, <laughs> that my only um, exposure to painting or art really was painting. And so for me to become an artist meant that I had to learn how to render the figure in real life because I had encyclopedias. I was like, you know, mm. that was my looking at pictures of Leonardo and Michelangelo and whoever was in the encyclopedia. So I think maybe if I was born in 83 instead of 73, I don't know what I would be doing now, maybe something a little bit different, but I think because of the lack of technology, um, I had to start with, you know, I guess what we would consider rudimentary tools now, like a pencil and paper. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those? <laughs> I, think, I think you bring up, um, first off, it's just so good to see you. It's again. good to see you too. It's, this is our first time seeing each other in a while. <laughs> I have a crush on Kahende. <laughs> um, you know, what Amy brings up is the material fact of art, which is that it's this urge that for some reason we've been doing for thousands of years. Arguably, uh, one of our earliest urges, we go and we see these caves where people spend so much time going to these dark, difficult places to find spaces to be alone and communicate something about who they are in this place. And the desire to be seen is pre-Kardashian. It's, <laughs> it's something that, that we see in the caves of Lestat. It's something that we see everywhere where we start to look at maybe the people that we didn't have time to look at and to recognize that it doesn't take a Louvre uh, or a, a Centre Pompidou to, to, to give you a sense of where all of the things that are important for a culture to arrive at. These places, these places exist in our stories. Um, they exist in the way that we raise our children and the values that we hand down. But I think painting occupies this very unique space because it's so just, you grind this rock down, you place your hand on a stone, and that's me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an instant form of portraiture that is immediately relatable and then the next kid wants to do it. And I'm sure there were zillions of them before, but we, all these years later, have seen the ones that exist. And the urge for me to become a portraitist is as old as time. Right. And I think we're talking about time in both the sense of, you know, 50 years, but also time immemorial, thousands of years. And that makes me wonder, you both have um, very intense relationships to photography and your work. Whenever I look at your renderings of figures, I think about the way these portraits work in our age of mechanical reproduction. And so I'd love to just hear you talk about the way photography, especially in the case of the subjects that we're talking about today, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, some of the most photographed people around how that affected the way that you wanted to render those subjects and subjects in general? Well, I think um, I came to photography uh, a little further into my studio practice. Um, as, I st as I, you know, embarked on this journey of like uh, painting these figures in solitude, mm -hmm. um, I was researching and looking for something and I found affirmation in photography um, and, and seeing myself represented through photography in ways that I couldn't find in painting. Um, so for me that was, that was when it kind of clicked for me and then it took me back to um, my childhood where um, I would, you know, on a rainy day on a Sunday be in our family room and there was a cabinet where my mother kept all of our pictures and there was one picture of my grandmother Jewel there was um, another photograph of my mother's father and his brother and mother and her husband. And something about those photographs always captivated me, like just the, 
the quietness of them, the, um, the ability to, um, you know, become authors of our own narrative post the invention of the camera, the way that we represented ourselves, the way that we dressed up, um, the way that clothes played a role in, um, in, in our lives at that point in time. So I think that um, although my figures are gray and people usually relate that to black and white photography, it was, it was an affirmation that I was moving in the right direction when I came across um, um, Du Bois's uh, exhibition in Paris of um, photographs of the Georgia Negro, mm -hmm. where I saw, um, and me being from Georgia too, was especially touched by that. And so I saw us, you know, um, trying to create a different narrative, something that was extricated from the dominant historical narrative, something that um, offered us a place to reimagine ourselves in a way. And so that for me was, was my connection to photography. Um, I am not a photographer, I do use a camera. Um, but if you saw the pictures that I take for the paintings, you'd probably be like, nah, that's not gonna look good at all. But it, you know, it's, there's, for me, it, it's a way to build um, my connection to the subject. And so as soon as I look into the viewfinder, that's when I start searching for the painting. So I don't make a sketch up or anything like that. Um, we put on different clothes. You know, I take 40 or 50 pictures. And then after a while, the subject stops feeling like a subject and then that's when that kind of natural divine presence sets in and you're able to capture something really special that I think that the camera cannot, cannot capture. Like the energy between the, myself and the subject that kind of comes alive in the painting in a different way energetically than it would live in a photograph. That's, that's, <clears throat> that's interesting because when I was listening to you, I was, I was thinking about well, you took me on a journey, which is basically like taking myself out of my own head and the way that I work, and I think that's a really effective way. I think every person who makes paintings now have to deal with the same question. At what point is, at what point is a painting valuable as an object in the world? It, okay, so clearly we had this conversation about there's the invention of the camera, so why make paintings anymore? People kept on making paintings. Why do we do it? There's something about uh, the trace, something about uh, your hand, its ability to make marks. We can all, all of us, line up here and make, uh, attempt to make a copy of a photograph or a, a copy of someone sitting in front of us, and it'll never arrive at the same painting moment. Whereas digital and or classic uh, cameras will give you a consensus. And I think the lack of consensus is where we lie here. What we're really uh, arriving at is a desire to get to something that's a bit more authentic. Photography is a tool. Does Barack Obama or Michelle Obama have the time to sit for 26 hours for us to sit day by day, one hour at a time, and do it the old classical way? No. So. We use the photography as a way to get there. But even before uh, the presidential portraiture, photographer for me was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to take something that has already been laid bare as a two-dimensional substrate and then to lay that even further bare by removing, diminishing certain colors, heightening others, taking textures that I love and putting those in there. The real question is what is the authentic item? Are you ever painting something that existed in the real world? Or are you painting something that is simply in your mind? Or perhaps, but for the, the, the existence of this technology in your mind and these people who were in the streets who you happen to have met, met all of these things arrive at this uh, incredibly important pregnant moment that we call the painting. And I think, uh, by and large, what I try to do in my work is to find complete strangers, people minding their own business, trying to get to work every day. And I just tap them on the shoulder and I say, listen, listen, I, I, I love the way you look. I, I, you've got something about, you look at my books, look at what I've done before. And it, it's, it's in New York, it's in Mumbai, it's in Sao Paulo. 
most people in big cities don't have the time of day. Most people say no. And so what you end up with are uh, an interesting subsection of people who say yes. And those people are the ones who are perhaps a bit more um, open to the idea of seeing themselves in, in, in broad form, open to art, open to any number of things. I can't extrapolate that. But in the end, it's this interesting experiment that starts to take place. And I think some aspect of that exists in both Amy and my own work, uh, which is that we have certain ideas in mind, but then we just allow the free range nature of the way that uh, radical contingency comes up against us. Like life just slams up against us and we say, okay, you. And the next thing you know, they're on the museum walls. What's so unique about this experience is that we're now talking about presidential portraiture, which is a lot more demonstrative, which is a, a lot more um, procedural, historically, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the perfect segue. I feel like we planned this. Um, but I know that both of you rarely, if ever, take commissions. And so to make a presidential portrait is to take, in some ways, the biggest commission that you, you might take in your career. Um, did the scale of the ask challenge you? Did you feel that there was maybe an element of service that you had to um, complete in a way that you don't necessarily feel when you're painting of your own volition, where you're choosing your own subject and making it a part of your own canon? Well, I mean, I always have to talk about Gehinde painting Michael Jackson first, because I'm like, after that, I feel like you can dream to do anything. So um, this was a big deal for me. It was also a big deal for him, but he had already painted Michael Jackson, so. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, I forgot the question now, what did you say? <laughs> Basically, this is, it's a huge commission, right, to do the portrait of former first lady and the president. How did you adjust from doing okay, what you normally yeah, yeah. do, which is to... So, uh, I mean, I, I, you honestly have to walk into this like it's, uh, your practice is what you do. I, you know, um... I think for a second I started to get ahead of myself and I'm like, should I do this different? Should I do that different? Mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know, she, she chose me to paint her because I do what I do. Um, and so I just stayed true to who I was in the process, um, which meant, you know, a back and forth conversation with Meredith Coop, her stylist, and um, trying to figure out, you know, how she wanted her, how she wanted to, you know, represent her her legacy um, with with her attire and what she was wearing, um, and we started out with eleven dresses, narrowed it down to two, and then we had a conversation about whether we wanted formal or casual, and we decided to go casual, um, and we met. We had um, I like to photograph my models outside. I like to rely on natural light. And so we had to figure out a place to um, photograph her where we could have outside light but still be in private. And we found this wonderfully, um, you know, very green backyard in DC that was surrounded by bamboo. So like we were back there and no, this is a house I probably walked past a million times going to Georgetown to go shopping and never paid attention to it. Um, and so she showed up and, um, she showed up in the dress that you see in the painting. Um, at the time, I had two dresses that I was going to try her in, but then I realized that that was the dress. You know, like you kind of, like you said, like you rely on the moment to tell you what to do, so I try not to plan too much, like I loosely plan. Um, and she sat down and I had to figure out, you know, I didn't want to plan a pose either. and. Uh, I photographed her for about an hour and a half. Um, the sun kept moving, so we kept moving. I had to pretend like I knew what I was doing the whole time. <laughs> like, the first 15 pictures were like too dark, but I'm like, okay, this is good, this is good. Okay, so now we're gonna move over here. We're gonna find the right light. And uh, we ended up on the grass in some shade. There was a lot of reflective light that was happening. It was really beautiful. Um, I found a stool for her to sit down in, and the way that the dress kind of 
um, laid itself out around her was beautiful and she looked like she was sitting atop a mountain. It was just like, just perfect. And uh, she's used to being photographed, so I think she was really comfortable with, with what was happening. I was a little less comfortable because when I'm searching for that painting, like I have to look her, I'm looking at her soul, you know what I mean? And so it's just this moment of like, is this weird for you? Um, and then, you know, she relaxed into this pose and I did a little directing with the fingers. Um, I always say this because I think it's funny, but when she had leaned forward the first time, she was like this. And then I said, you know, we can't do that because people are gonna think you're like, like black power. Like a secret black power, you know, stance or something like that. So um, I remember pulling her fingers out, and she has really long, beautiful fingers, and and it just it just kind of happened. But it was it was the moment that she just you know went into her. You kind of become less aware of yourself, and I think it was a really private, intimate moment. And I clicked the shutter, and like I knew that was it, even though I shot her a second time. At a, a later date, I, I knew at that moment that was the picture. Thank you. So wow, it's, it's so interesting because I remember when Amy and I met. You guys have to realize we were told to keep this thing top, top secret for a year for and a half, an, an entire year and a half. So imagine walking through the world just knowing that. Like, <laughs> And so we both locked eyes, and she knew that I had the commission, and we both sort of like had this moment of like, finally, <laughs> we can sort of like give each other in conversation a little bit of this sort of like tense, uh, tense, I, I don't think it's ever yeah. possible to just, uh, the, the reason why both of these portraits are both so incredibly um, of their time, urgent, succinct and with this feeling of urgency is because it because this this is our first black yeah, president head of state in the most powerful nation in quotations <laughs> in the world and so i am i'm here um uh, now at the moment of conversation with obama and i'm saying uh, Mr. President, I'd like to, to paint your portrait for these and these reasons. You don't just get the gig. You, you show up at the Oval Office yeah. and you have to go through the, the song and dance. And I would love to know who the other artists are. I don't know. No one's telling me. Like, I know one. Okay, we'll talk. <laughs> Tell me after. <laughs> right. And so, as you may well know, my, my work is about the powerless. My work is about those people who are not seen, the people who aren't celebrated. And Barack Obama says to me, your work is about the powerless. Your work is about the people who are not seen, etc. What are you going to do with this situation? <laughs> I feel like I was in like an alcoholic black ox. Black ox. I don't remember what I said, but I came out of there like the Matrix or something. <laughs> Towards the end, it was all hugs and all back slaps. And I knew that there was something different. There was a lighter energy in the room, and I knew that I got it. I didn't get the official letter, but I, I, you can tell when you do a great job interview or what have you. Yeah. Um, the question has to do not with photography, rather with, with uh, bring me back to what. <laughs> Just how you, I mean, basically what Barack Obama asked you, which is to say your work is about the powerless, yeah. so how do you place yeah. the most powerful man in All the right. world so, in so the canon? I, I'm, I was being a little bit um, hyperbolic about the whole alcoholic blackout part. <laughs> um, what, I, what I would say is this. What I would say is that um, when confronted with that question, I went immediately to the personal. Because portraits start where you are. They start with the individual that you're sitting here in front of. And I, I said, my job is to be a, a steward of, of your story as, and as close to it as I can. If you look um, at what the moves ultimately were with regards to his body language, um, with regards to his dress, 
even his attitude, you know, how the back sits in, in, in the chair. All of these things are like hyper thought about. You can think about it a lot, but you just have to, you have to shoot thousands and thousands and thousands of shots. And, no, and you know, he doesn't have all the time in the world, so we're just like constantly shooting and moving and shooting and moving. But the bottom line was that I wanted to have something that felt open. What he wanted, if, if I can put words into his mouth, is that I want the world to know that I'm not just sitting up there separate from the people that I represent. I want something that shows that I'm right here with the people that I represent. And so there's a reason why he's, his whole carriage is, is moving forward. There's a whole reason why it's not in this sort of tight, uh, bound situation that you see in so many of those beautiful portraits of the past in the presidential halls. Sure, it's the continuation of a story that we've heard before, that we've seen before. When you go to the great uh, Smithsonian uh, presidential hall in Washington, D.C., you'll see portraits of white men, by and large, all. And you'll see them following a very laid out tradition. And so what I wanted to do was to break that glass in case of emergency, this was the emergency. Mm -hmm. The emergency <laughs> was, we need to figure out a new language for something that we've never dealt with before. And I wanted to use his life story as the language. I wanted to use his life story as the background, the field. When you look at those flowers behind him, there's flowers that come from different episodes and chapters in his life. We wanted to fracture, break the glass, and pick up little pieces and put them back up. And so you've got Kenya in there, and you've got Chicago and Hawaii, and et cetera, et cetera. So he is literally one of the most global people in terms of his spiritual sense, his personal sense, his political sense. That urge, I hoped to communicate in the painting, and I hope I did. You did. <laughs> So when I think of the portrait, you know, as a unit, I think of it as evidence of a social connection between the sitter and the painter. And in both of your work, I'm always so um, taken by the gaze of the subject who often feels like they're penetrating through the canvas to look directly at me. And I was wondering, um, how do you access or what is the work that you have to do in order to give materiality to this idea of an inner life, right? I think what was so startling about the presidential portraits is that compared to what we normally see, they looked like people as opposed to just symbols of the state. And so I'm interested in what your uh, practice or process is in understanding your subject's identities and how that is brought to the canvas and their gaze in particular. Um, well, one of the first things I did when, you know, after I, I got that phone call, um, 30 minutes later, I'm like, well, let me get on the internet. And I just looked at every single picture that had ever been taken of her. And I was like, I want to do the exact opposite of that, mm. you know? Um, but, you know, this painting is a representation of, of 21st century womanhood. Um, and it was important that I connect her to not only that, but also a, a greater American story as well, a black American story. And so I think, um, I think it's a little, it was a little bit easier for me because, um, you know, as women we dress and our clothes are a huge, a huge expression of who we are. And the one thing that drew me to the dress that Michelle Smith made was that the, the, the fabric that it was made from, the print that was on the fabric, reminded me of the G's Ben quilts mm -hmm. from the G's Ben woman, women in Alabama. And that was a show I saw at the Whitney in 2008. Yeah. And uh, I'm from Georgia, even though you can't tell. <laughs> um, so Alabama's really close to my heart. My mom's from Mobile. Um, and so that was, that for me, that really grounded her in in uh, American history and in black American history to be able to make that relation without it being um, too didactic, so a reference to art history and American history all wrapped up in one. It was, it was perfect and it made it really easy for me to um, place her in this um, iconic moment, but 
um, also as, you know, as she calls herself, um, I think it's even on her Instagram page, like she's a, you know, a girl from the south side of Chicago. Like all of that had to be encompassed in this portrait. And um, that's, you know, I don't know. That's what, I don't even know what I'm saying now. That's what I wanted to do and that's what I did. That's what how she showed up and, you know, that's the conversation that we had. And, uh, and I think, um, yeah, I think for me it was really the dress that, that like sealed, sealed it for me in, in, this, in, this, in the story that I wanted to tell. Because had it been flowers, it would have, it would have come off very, it would have come off very different. You know, it would have been a different painting. Hmm. I almost forgot that we were um, there because the, there, there was something about the, the last part where you were talking about had it been flowers, had it been... Um, there, okay, so going back to what is fascinating about painting is that we, we see something of... of Ourselves, we see something that's exciting. Uh, that's not it. That's not good enough. Okay, so there's a difference between looking at a bowl of fruit, looking at a landscape, and looking at the portrait of someone that uh, happens to be a human being. As you get closer and closer to uh, as you get closer and closer to um, people who look like you, people who resonate your identity, you start to, f you start to feel as though this museum or this, this, this space um, is communicating something about me and the people. I start to feel a sense of belonging. So uh, now we're talking not only about portraiture, landscapes, still us, but we're talking about how these paintings fit in a social mode, how do they fit in, on the wall on the wall of a museum, on the wall of a house, where do they feel the best? And so for, for so long, I have been looking at really elegant, piss-elegant portraits and piss-elegant landscapes. Um, the mechanical use of paint and thinner and wax and oils to create the illusion of life at its most celebrated. And I figured at some point there must be some space left for me, somewhere I can figure out how to make, because you know, I've, see, I've seen Goya's way of painting black people. It's cute, but it's, it's not up to the occasion. <laughs> and you know, David has gotten there. They, all of the big boys from Western art history have gotten there. But I think it makes so much of a difference um, when we ourselves are the authors of stories. We don't, we don't say to uh, Van Dyck, well, why is every one of your paintings white? I don't, I don't think he probably had that utterance happen a day in his life. I've had that happen to me a zillion times along, and I'm sure you've, you've heard this foolishness. <laughs> we, we're living now in an age in which we have the opportunity to tell our truths and to use the vocabularies that we inherit not only from West Africa and from the native peoples who were slaughtered here, but also from Europe, which by virtue of rape or desire is in a lot of our blood. And so I belong to all of this. And I, I demand radically to have access to the code, to be able to say, let's reinvent painting, right? But it, it's, it's not something that's um, easily taught. You know, the academies don't do it so much. I think in, in favor of conceptual ideas and ideation, um, we sort of leave the material practice of painting aside. And I think that's a, that's a shame because mm -hmm. there is something to be said about writing the great novel. Right. We'll use literature as an example. How do you get there if you, if you don't know the mechanics of writing? And I think painting's the same way. So not to be an old curmudgeon, you young art students out there, um, I'm simply saying that um, we need to learn the rules in order to break them. Right? And I think in, ter in, terms of, um, in terms of representation, in terms of um, the type of portrait that I wanted to see uh, on this occasion, obviously we, we went into the rules and we knew that the rules were very staid and the, the, the fact of our being 
shattered every possible rule possible. And so any utterance we made was ultimately going to give rise to something that was new under the sun. And that's rare in the art world. Um, I went to the Alice Neal show at the Met over the summer, and I saw this really beautiful portrait of two young black boys looking at um, their painter with consternation in their eyes. It's, it's really amazing. And then later, I read in the Times that they were able to find one of the subjects who was now um, you know, in his 60s or 70s, and there's an article explaining his reaction to looking at this painting, and it made me wonder, it really stuck in my mind, do your subjects ever, do you ever keep in touch with any of them? Have they ever expressed any reaction to seeing themselves as transformed by you? Um, I wonder if there's a sense of defamil defamiliarization when they see the body that they've lived with for their entire lives processed by another eye. It's just a curiosity that I had. Um. The first time somebody asked me that question was a few years ago, and then that's when I realized how transactional <laughs> my relationship was to my models, and I'm like, I could change that. I mean, I, I have some that, I'm, that I feel very connected to, and um, one of them, mostly when I, if I'm photographing children, so I have a few paintings that are um, preteen and some teenagers, and um, those are really special to me, and one little girl in particular, her name was Morgan, um, I, when I was living in Baltimore, she was playing in Patterson Park and her brother was at football practice and, uh, I walked up to her when I saw her immediately, I knew I wanted to paint her. Like she had the perfect little face, the perfect braids, the perfect little sundress. And, um, I walked up to her and I was like, you know, where's your mom? And I said, uh, you know, I have a question I want to ask her. And uh, I was chatting with her and, and, you know, asked her what her favorite subject was in school. And she was like, it's math. And she said, um, um, and then they, you know, they send me to another classroom for reading. She's like, because I read so well, like, I'm not really sure what else they can teach me or something like that. Like, she was just like everything I wanted to be, you know. <laughs> and um, so when she saw her portrait, um, the beautiful thing about children is that they give you an honest response, you know? So she looked at it and she was like, I think you got me. I think you did a pretty good job, <laughs> you know? And uh, she, it was, you know, she, she literally didn't want to leave me. So like, um, maybe I have a spirit of an angel, but you know, I, I met her, I met her mom. I went to the house and photographed her and then she ended up hanging out with me for the rest of the day. And so we hung out and like, you know, just did stuff, just did girl stuff. Um, and then some people like it too much. Like I have some people that I'm like, why did I paint you? <laughs> because they're like trying to order like a 10 foot by 10 foot post, you know what I mean? Like I have one or two like that where I'm like, man, never again. Um, but I think it's, you know, I think it's important. And I think especially when they, when they not, not in a gallery setting so much, but like when you walk into a museum and you get to see yourself on a wall like that, you know, within an institution that tells you um, what to hold as valuable and, you know, uh, it's a, like a container for history, then I think it, it, feels, it feels different to them. And I think it's, um, I don't know, like they kind of blush at seeing themselves sometimes, you know, I think it's really special. That's cool. Um, no, no, so I paint from photography. I meet people randomly. Most of my process is basically I will um, either uh, go to the internet and put out some weird like words saying like this, 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 and this and start to create like an image type in my head, which is kind of an interesting new thing. Um, or I just take to the streets and I um, uh, go to mostly black and brown communities all over the world and just helicopter in not knowing anything about who I'm going to meet, trying to bone up on, uh, you know, histories as much as you can, cultures as much as you can from a distance. I think so much of what I'm doing is I'm kind of coming in there as 
uh, black, sure, but also like a male, cisgendered American who has a desire to sort of capture someone's image to create large priced luxury goods for wealthy consumers. <laughs> I mean, if we're gonna talk about what it is, it, 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 we are creating contemporary art about the black body. And I exist in one, sure. But what is this urge to constantly see myself refractured throughout the world? I think, it's, I think it's complicated and beautiful, but it's very difficult territory to talk about unless you're able to deal with subtlety. So the, 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 the adventure is this. The 70s happen, black shit goes crazy. Hip hop is everywhere. We start recognizing that it is the leading edge of all of our culture. We, the Americans, start to beam it out into the rest of the world. Young people from Tel Aviv to Sao Paulo to Colombo, Sri Lanka, are now fabricating new lives, new identities, new selves based on this very American narrative. My black ass wants to go out there and see it. And I want to, I want to go out there and see it and record it in a way that they themselves have control over it. They themselves decide how they position their bodies. What are your local histories? Creating films about what the process is, laying everything bare so that you, the interested or uninterested or uninitiated viewer says, what, 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 what is going on here? What are all these reference points? What, are, what is this flotsam, this jet? Because insofar as we say black and brown this and that, insofar as we try to look at different frontiers that exist on the peripheries of what has dominantly been consuming all the oxygen in the room, when you really give a chance for someone to tell their own story personally, that's it. You know, that's when the rubber hits the road. Uh, the real question is, are you ever affecting change if it's on a, such a small scale in such elite institutions in such uh, diminished vocabulary compared to broader traditional media, social media, et cetera? I, I don't think that's shit. I, I, don't, I don't think those things matter. I think that what really matters is uh, a real true concerted effort and that all media of all types take what happens in present and past tense and discovers, rediscovers, recycles, whatever. So perhaps there's something that's not being consumed readily at the moment when it's being, or maybe not seen as uh, prescient at the moment. But I'm telling you, when, when people tell and show up as their real selves and are, are given the, the permission uh, to occupy their truths without uh, too much interference, there's something there. The second question has to do with like, do you ever see them again? No, I don't. <laughs> I can't. I mean, there's just, just like literally this, this desire to try to, in this short life that I have, see as many interesting places and stories. And uh, if, 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 I, if I made my life's goal to be become best friends, becoming best friends with every subject, and that would, I think that would undermine the broader superstructure. And the superstructure is, is something that's like, it sounds all fancy, but it's basically the thing that makes me feel happy about getting up in the morning, like answering new questions about what it feels like to be um, young, alive, the desire to fashion oneself, to be seen as beautiful, to flirt, to wanna fall in love one day. Like that's all that stuff you see in pictures. It's very romantic. And we live in very unromantic times. I love romantic shit. <laughs> I remember very vividly the day the portraits were unveiled. I was watching it live. And as soon as they pulled down those brown wraps, I was like, this is a moment. I think we can all agree that no one has really historically cared about the presidential portraits <laughs> before you two. And at that day, it was the biggest news story. Everyone was talking about it, you know, at the braiding shop, at the supermarket. And that's a very rare occurrence that people talk about art in that way. And I have to ask, what was your reaction to the reactions? Because the reactions were really strong. 
Um, Amy, I think in particular, people were really stunned by your use of color, and it forced people to kind of deprogram the parts of the brain that are like, what I see in the real world is what I should see in the art world. And that was really phenomenal to watch. Um, Kehinde, people are familiar with your work, but I think that people were also stunned by how non-presidential Barack's pose looks in the portrait. And so I'm curious to know, were there any reactions that surprised you? Were you prepared for the avalanche of connection that people are still feeling? I mean, look at this room. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there was a, there, for me, there was a, um, a, a little bit of a buildup because I did, um, once, once it was, uh, once it was leaked, because it was leaked yep. early. Um, By who? I don't know, one of the donors probably. But um, I was getting letters already from like young people all over the country that um, were expressing their growing excitement for it and their um, desire to see someone like us make art because some of them wanted to be artists but didn't really understand under, understand what that meant or you know couldn't picture it or didn't didn't see it as something that would, they could actually do and and make a living um, so that was really special to me to to get these letters from high school students from kindergartners from teachers um, that that was part of the buildup and then and then afterwards I think that day was probably one of the most vulnerable days I've ever had in my whole life because you're unveiling a portrait that literally the globe is invested in the outcome of and I don't know whether you felt that pressure but I was like Whew, you know the people you know it's like it's something that was like a wonderful experience and um you kind of, you really have to have your wits about yourself because you know there's going to be criticism. And um, I really honestly didn't think that there would be any criticism about the fact that I paint in, in Grisaille. Um, I don't think Michelle thought about that either because it's like that's the reason why, you know, she picked me. Um, but I thought it was wonderful and great that, that people were so tuned in and so willing to have a conversation and debate. And... Um, you know, some people were crying and happy and some people were angry because they felt like blackness wasn't represented and everybody has the right to feel the way that they, that, that they want to feel. I mean, that's, that's just what art is for. If everybody liked it, then something's probably really wrong with it, you know? Um, and, you know, some people like their poetry to rhyme, some people don't. And so that's, you know, so it was, it was interesting. I don't know, like, I, I feel like I'm still recovering from that day, honestly. <laughs> whenever the portraits travel, I feel like I go through this level of anxiety all over again whenever they land somewhere new. Um, and it's being seen by new eyes and, and, and being taken in and processed. And, um, but overall, it was a really positive and wonderful experience. And all I needed was what I got, which was, um, you know, once you finish the portraits, the, 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 the board of commissioners or whatever they have to approve it, and then they send it to they sent it to Michelle and Barack, and and I I got a text back that says you did it, congratulations, I love it. That's right. So that's all I needed. Um, yeah, the, uh, listen, I remember when Amy called me up after this thing. Do you mind if I quote you directly? Okay, go. She was like, she was like, she was like, I hate the internet. <laughs> it's a horrible place. It is a horrible place. Do you place. remember that? You remember I never that? experienced trolls. <clears throat> trolls are, yeah. And like, okay, so that's fair, but like, are we really going to compare or, or proceed with the internet as our measurement gauge. No. What we're going to do is we're going we're to take a life's experience of looking, an intuitive sense of what dignity and power is, and you're going to tell everybody else, shut the up. 
I mean, basically, yeah, yeah it's, it because wasn't like, made to be viewed no, digitally. No, seriously, seriously. And, you know, I mean, for what it's worth, everyone's got, it, you know, they're like um, uh, belly buttons. We, we all have one, right? So we're, we're all born with opinions. We're all born with belly buttons. I think that what, what we've got is um, a real high water mark with understanding skin. I mean, do, do you guys even know what grisaille is? Like, do we, like, could, have you unpacked exactly what it is that you gave to these people? <laughs> I say this in quotations, but what I'm saying is like, there's like this world that artists live in, and then there's this world that like the rest of us, you know, have to lead our everyday lives. No one lives in this, some strange sort of academic, mechanical world of painting. But for a number of years, those of us who are lucky enough to have an academic training in paintings, we actually have to sort of go into our caves. Mm -hmm. And we go off and we understand the mechanics of painting and the emotions surrounding them, the, 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 the wars and the, the countries that give rise to certain grand uh, paintings. But really, rarely, has anyone ever been able to marry their own personal um, feelings and positions with all of that stuff that has to do with history and churches and states and governments and statecraft? Well, this stuff just showed up at our front door. And now we're dealing with the consequences of dealing with a personal set of aesthetic choices, as well as uh, recognizing that there's a broader set of viewers, uh, a diverse set of viewers. But like Amy said, if the head of state or if the first lady says, this is how I choose to be represented, I don't care what you have to say. <laughs> because this is what they are choosing as their way of saying, this was my period of time in this presidency. This was my period of time on this earth and I've spent my entire life getting to this moment. I've chosen this young woman and this young man, not as young, um, <laughs> to, to be the authors of my story. That, that, that I think is, um, is, is really um, worthwhile. The second thing has to do ultimately with the judge that you have inside of yourself. So there was for me, um, a lot of doubt with regards to, am I able to make a painting with so much pressure? I wanted to be able to have like this sort of like running click click thing going on with cameras. So as I'm painting, there's like this timeline thing. But we did it in a way such that there was like a sound every few seconds. And so there was every 15 seconds like this reminder, like this is presidential, don't mess up. <laughs> And I think that ultimately, more than the internet, was such like a brain worm. It really um, destabilized me. It took me a, so there are versions of the presidential portrait. There's the one that went out, and then there's the other ones that were like, eh, okay. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you two so much for talking with me tonight. I want to ask one more question before we open it up to the audience for a Q&A. Um, you can queue up at the microphones that you see in the aisle there. Uh, it's started with a simple question. We could end with a simple one. What's going on now? What's up next? Well, um, I am working towards an exhibition in London in October 2022. Um, what else? I don't know. Like I basically wake up and walk my dogs. <laughs> I have three dogs, August Wilson, George, and Wheezy. <laughs> and they Not keep George and Wheezy. George and Wheezy, we a black family. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my partner likes to say. That's what Kevin says. It's like, oh, George and Wheezy. It's like, yeah, we're a black family. Mm -hmm. um, and they keep us busy like we have three kids, honestly. Like, I don't even know how I find time to paint because I'm picking up poop all the time. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I'm just living life. I'm just trying to enjoy the fact that we're even having this conversation in person. It's just really nice to be in the presence of people. Um, I feel very lucky that um, I had a career that was able to sustain me within the pandemic. I feel very blessed um, and, you know, I had enough to help my family or whoever needed something during that time. And um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm two years from being 50. I have a lot going on in my head about that. <laughs> Trying to be a grown up. Paying taxes and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I've been um, doing a lot of work in Africa. So during the pandemic, um, when all this stuff was going down in New York, I was in Senegal and, um, and a bit in Nigeria as well. So I've started up an organization called BlackRock. BlackRock is, uh, uh, you don't know. BlackRock is an art um, residency program where artists from all over the country and all over the world, open to black folks, brown folks, white folks, Asian folks, whatever. We want to be able to have Africa, West Africa specifically, which is my, where my father's from, Nigeria. Um, we want to have West Africa as a center of excellence, a site where people from all over the world can just kind of show up and, and create art together. So what did I do? I, uh, years ago, before any of this stuff was going on, I got there and I started constructing um, a space that originally was just supposed to be my own painting space, but then I started thinking broadly about like who would I want to be there, and so very quickly it started to become something that we wanted to create a program surrounding. Right now we have three artists in residence every year. It's modeled around the Studio Museum in Harlem. I'm an alum of the Studio Museum in Harlem, and thank you to Thelma <laughs> Golden and Kasim Kim and Larry Stokes Sims and all of them. This is this is this is this is something that I wanted to do because that's what you do um, if you're raised right. You, you take that space that gave you your lift and you create that new space for other people to get their lift, right? So the model is three at a time. And I'm not the judge, thank God, can you imagine? Um, so um, we have great curators, great artists, great filmmakers, um, actors, you name it, people of goodwill. They decide who the next artist will be and I provide new spaces. We started in Senegal. I'm now building in other West African countries. I can't tell you too much, but it's slowly, I hope, going to be this sort of aesthetic disease that just sort of passes <laughs> through. And so when you start thinking about um, the West Coast of Africa, you start thinking about artistic excellence. And we start to um, allow people to firsthand live in these spaces that I have come to love and know, and um, as opposed to just receiving them from like TV or the web or whatever. It's so different being there and then like slowing down and actually making work and then that influencing your work. And then there's like a whole community of people who've been through BlackRock before and you can share experiences. Like it's, it's basically a social movement, but it's through the auspices or through the guise of an art project. So that's what I'm up to. Good job. Uh, thank you so much. So I think we'll start with the right side, and then we'll do the left side, and then we'll do the right side. <laughs> thank you. Can you hear me? Good evening. Um, I want to thank you both for uh, being uh, the keepers of this spirit um, and allowing yourselves to be used. I myself never had any interest in going to the um, Museum of Portraiture in DC until <laughs> your two portraits were there. Um, I looked at all of the portraits and um, I think JFK and George W. had like a little different flow from everybody else's and then there were your portraits. I don't care who does the next one, but what I do... <laughs> <laughs> My question is, no one really, I think, cares about who painted the other ones or the next one, but your two names are gonna be forever in history. And do you both understand the magnitude of that? Like, how are you living with that? You know, because again, who did the others? 
Next one, nobody cares, but Amy Sherrill, Kahinde <laughs> Wiley, like, that's like a big deal. Just try, I'm trying to live up to that. <laughs> yeah, this, it's, it's a high watermark, let's face it. And, there, the, with, and it's, it's bigger than, it's bigger than uh, I would like to think I am. I think, I think when you think about the presidency, you think about the nation and the trappings of power and, uh, and what a nation really is, is about storytelling. What a democracy is, is about storytelling. What uh, capitalism is, or money, or, or human rights, or any of these things that we tell ourselves, it's about how much we really believe in it. And uh, as the, there's a reason why she doesn't care about the next portrait. It's because we've decayed the story. We've, we've damaged the story. And insofar as we think that uh, stories are for kids, no, that's just practice. We're, we're, this is, we have to stay in the habit of creating institutions that care about uh, people and, and care about um, those of us who maybe aren't as lucky and fortunate. And I think that's um, it's a wise thing that she said, which is that you should be aware of your position now because you're part of that story. Don't mess it up. I heard you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a New Yorker, born and raised, and I'm so happy you are here today with us. Um, Ms. Cheryl, I, I didn't know you before the portraits, but I'm adamantly gonna follow you from here on end. Um, Mr. Kahinda Wiley, I've been a fan of yours for quite a while. Um, and I wanted to, I realized something when I saw the portraits, is that um, you usually hang your paintings low and eye level. And when I was first drawn to you was because I've done inner city work with young people. And, and I also loved reading comic books. So when I saw your stuff, I was attracted to seeing my community represented and in such a beautiful way. Um, sometimes in an adventurous way, very romantic way. But they were always hung low. And then I thought, this is forcing people to look at young black men in their eyes, in their faces. And I was really drawn to that. And I wonder with the Obama portrait, when I saw it here, it was a, raised a little higher. And I know you said that the lean in was a way for us to connect as equal people. So will you continue to um, hang it this high or will you bring it back low again? I'm curious. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was actually supposed to be hung low, but um, there was a curatorial decision made um, without me knowing because they wanted um, Michelle and Barack both to be eye level. But I absolutely 100% prefer it to be hung low. And by the time that I found out, it was too late to change it. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, but seriously, yeah, so it's, that wasn't me, that wasn't me. I think it's really important that the work be hung though, and I think it's really important that people um, be able to approach the painting as, you know, Michelle and Barack live in the world because they're very approachable people. Um, and they're very real and very human. And so the, um, the affect of it being higher is, um, is um, I guess, a a, a misrepresentation of, of my of my vision. Well, how was it in, how was it in um, in DC? Was it, it different? Was, it was low. It, it was, was different. Low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because now was it? it well, it's, it's serious. Like now, now they're together. Now they're together. So and, I mean, it's, and it's like a, yeah. It's a it's a tough conversation for anyone, whether it be a curator. But ultimately, your point of view should be the one that is. Uh, well, I've got my own. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your question, though. So, uh, from DC here, and I want to say I truly have never seen as many people lined up to see anything at the Portrait Gallery as your pieces. So, 100%, they brought the people in, and I think that's really important for um, 
changing the way museums are, are engaging with the public. Um, what do you think museums should do based on the response to your portraits to get younger people in and to get more diverse populations in to see that the museums really are for them? I mean, they, they have to start showing more diverse artists. I mean, women artists, artists of color, um, just a more diverse, you know, selection of artists. I mean, I, I was um, talking to Doreen backstage and I was telling her about my experience of, um, of um, going, getting into graduate school and how the second year graduates got to pick the cohort from the first year. So we would look at all these slides and I was studying with Grace Hardigan at the time and we would do a, a blind selection at first. And if we blindly picked, it was always just seven white guys. And so then we had to say, okay, well, do we just want a Hofburger School of Painting program just full of white guys? And so, you know, we had to make a conscious effort to bring some diversity into the program. And I think museum institutions have to think about it in the same way and really represent the cities that they are in and educate the viewer um, and, you know, carry them along this, this um, historic art historical journey that, you know, that, that we're taking on because we study art history. You know, we start with cave painting and we work our way up through figurative painting and then we have discussions about individualism and abstract expressionism and what all that means and how it relates to society and all these things are really important. But I think, you know, when you think about art history and you think about, um, the fact that you know black artists really weren't even given shows until the 1920s and 30s that weren't in the lobby of a YMCA that you know we've we've come very far but we still have a very long way to go when it comes to um, being represented on museum walls and in art history in general I think it also um, museums have to realize that who who's paying the bills are the people who happen to be alive. You know, so much of what happens is there's entropy. There's donors who gave quite a bit, uh, uh, people who've had uh, a, a sense of, well, this is what the, the, the future, uh, excuse me, this is what the past has meant heretofore, and so I'm endowing this chair to go on and forward the mission of this said a set of cultural expectations and points of view. I think, it's, I think it takes an act of bravery and, a and an act of uh, realism to say that, well, uh, we want this thing to continue into the 22nd century. We want uh, for uh, the language of museum culture to continue to thrive. And muse the trouble here is that we, th we think about museums as being these sort of calcified institutions that stop at a certain point. And they've always been changing. They've constantly been moving and, and uh, regulating who they are based on who their audience base is. In this experiment, this accident, this uh, glorious accident that we call America, we have an, a unique opportunity to be able to access the world itself, all types of people, as our audience base, and to say, well, what does a, mu do, what does a museum do now? Museums heretofore have been in the job, they're, they're, had a fiduciary responsibility to, to create our high water marks as a society. This is what we stand for as a people. And if you don't do that, then who else is gonna do it? Museums are cultural institutions because cultural institutions are the arbiters of truth. When our media organizations can't, when our family dinner table conversations can't, we look towards culture as unifying our stories, as saying that there's something for us to, to, to galvanize ourselves around. And I think that in order for any of us to continue to have moments like this, we need to continue having moments like this. We need to continue having moments that say yes to people who happen to look not entirely like the other presidents on the wall. Um, and to be able to feel as though there's nothing wrong with being a young white guy in art school and having to compete in equal measure. That's what it means to be
properly in America. If we want to live up to uh, the promises. And I, and I think that is what's exciting about seeing all these new voices on Instagram and on social media and stuff. It's like, shit, there's just so many of us. And, you know, in different parts of the world, in different, different um, types of bodies and different types of political uh, realities. And then, uh, can you imagine what it must be like to be a curator right now? <laughs> to be able to say, like, what is the world picture? I remember at Yale, we studied a class called The World Picture. And, it was in, and, the, in the, and the organizing conceit was that these are the most important things to be seen and consumed, and that's it. I think the meal is much broader than the table. I think we have time for just two more questions, so we'll do this okay. side and then over here. That. Thank you. That. I must say congratulations on a very excellent job done. The portraits are very impressive, and I would say you're great role models for the young people, black people, people of all race to, to follow. My question to you both is, what message would you like to leave with a teenager who, who dreams of being a successful artist? And I'd, I'd appreciate a response from you both. Thank you. Well, my first response is um, learn how to be comfortable with risk. Um, become comfortable with the idea of working for something that's not empirical. Um, be ready to hear a whole lot of no's before you hear a whole lot of yeses, because they will come. And I always say that um, just, just keep going, like keep working. Um, go out and live in the world. Um, sometimes students that I've worked with say that they have like a creative block but I say you, you just haven't lived enough yet. Like you just need to live your way into the answers like Rilke says, like it's all out there and you just have to like fill yourself up with enough life and things. And that's what builds your visual vocabulary really. It's, it's, it doesn't happen for me at least, it didn't happen like sitting in my studio in a room. Um, I know for example, the one year that I, um, started paint, painting again because I had stopped for a while to move back to Georgia for familial obligations. And um, I didn't paint for the whole year, but every day I got up, I went to my studio, I cried because nothing was happening. And that year I learned how to sail and I, oh, I said sail, sorry, wait, sail? I learned how to sa uh -oh. <laughs> sail a boat, not sail. Um, <laughs> That's the country coming out. And uh, I poured my heart into that because I was trying to figure out where I was supposed to be in this conversation. You know, having already studied artists like Kahinde and, you know, looking at artists like Hank Willis and Micheline and, you know, these people that I'm fortunate to call my contemporaries now. And um, it, realizing that it, it's less about luck than it is. I think about strategy and being able to pay attention to um, how you can connect your narrative to an uh, an art like an art historical narrative. I think that's like the brilliance of Kehinde Wiley is is exactly that, um, and I think that's something that I think you know as artists we feel like we are supposed to wait to be found. And I guess there is some truth to that because you just can't walk into a gallery and say, I want, I want to show my work with you. But I think, you know, pay attention to the work that's being made in the world. Go to art fairs, look at the climate. Um, try not to be repetitive. I think it's really important that young black artists um, create in a way that's elevating us um, even higher. And when I say that, I mean that, you know, a lot of my students sometimes they'll learn about history, they'll learn about American history, 
And for example, they learn about like the black, the brown paper, the, the brown paper bag test, and then everybody makes work about that. So like every year, there's somebody that's like making work about like that one point in time in history. And so to learn how to carry carry that history with you and the weight of that history, um, but bring it into modernity and put something out there that um, you can connect to that art historical narrative, but it's still truly you. And I think that's that's what that's what I did. That's how I found my voice. Was like if I'm sitting in a room with Kehinde, Hank, McLean, Kara, like who am I going to be in that room? And then I realized that, you know, my story to tell is connected to my own narrative, which was growing up in the South and the performative aspects of my identity and how that influenced who I was. And it's just some it developed it developed from there. So. Connect your work to your own story. I feel like the, the best work that I see that I love is always kind of connected to the artist's story in some way, shape, or form. Um, I think that's really important. And um, yeah, just don't quit because eventually you rise to the top because quitters, there's a lot of quitters in the world. What do you tell, what do you tell to a uh, okay, so um, in order to tell someone how to deal with being an artist right now, I'd be best equipped by knowing what circumstances they'd be facing, like if they were going to school. And I don't know what the hell is going on with, like, uh, like there's a whole different environment. Like when I first went to art school, uh, oh, 19, I'm 44 now, so it was 1995, going into San Francisco, uh, San Francisco Art Institute, looking at this sort of dying story of abstract expressionism and sort of hippiedom and recognizing that capitalism is sort of strangely won and like Silicon Valley was moving in and the sort of like first steps of its grossness. <laughs> like I'm just stepping out of high school, like high, and ultimately what I decided was I'm gonna have to just like hunker down and someone here is gonna be brighter than I am and I'm gonna be able to pick up some bricks and build some walls and perhaps there will be a foundation for something, who knows. All these years later, after a few thumps and bumps, I think that that was probably some pretty damn good advice. To hunker down and try to figure out the mechanical ends towards a means. And what I mean by that is just how to make stuff physically, how to do printmaking, how to do watercolor, how to do uh, uh, oil painting, how to work with acrylics, how to, how to use uh, pretty much any uh, uh, medium that appeals to you personally as an artist. And not only to know how to do it well, but understand the history of it and understand um, the ins and outs of it. I think the material practice of painting is something that you can easily develop a love affair with. And so much as one can love uh, filmmaking and, and writing, easily you can learn that the, the way that someone makes oil paint is just one way. You can make that stuff in your own studio. You can grind that stuff yourself. Uh, you can slowly create little universes that are so based on just the small technical aspects but they're so you that you don't even realize that you're starting to create your own vocabulary just by being yourself, making your own thing. And so by virtue of just being in your world and knowing your craft, all you have to do next is to open your eyes and look at the world. Because that's really what your, your call to arms is, is to be as honest to yourself as possible about what it is that's in front of you and how it makes you feel. You don't have any political imperative to make anything about blackness or womanness or gender this or any sort of political anything. Be your best little fabulous self and know what the fuck you're trying to know and know how to <laughs> and know how to do it well with with grace with with with. Uh... The thing about me is that is that I also recognize the unfair aspects of um, the art industrial complex and how there's so many of us who are so incredibly talented but don't have the right connections or the right families 
or the right grades, et cetera. One of the things that I've noticed about New York City is that while it may not be a, met a meritocracy, it's tribal. And so all of the folks that I was starting to hang out with up in Harlem when I first came to New York were people who, um, who were part of the same emotional, uh, cultural, intellectual temperature. We were a tribe of young magicians up there in Harlem. And we took care of each other. And there were certain people that we would make sure that we, each other knew. I would say to this prospective um, art student that they should try to find their tribe. Mm -hmm. That they should try to get in there and perhaps not fit in. Because, you know, getting a bunch of artists together is like herding cats. There's, there's, <laughs> you're not gonna find too much in the way of, of group think. But with regards to charting out your own path, do all the stuff that any young person would do. Check out all the work that's on the internet. There's tons of stuff on the internet. And recognize the difference between the taste in your mouth and the taste of everything else that enters it. That's not me, that's not me. You drink water, that's not you. Know who you are. I always use the, 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 the sort of like the baseline example of who I am as a person as that sort of simple object lesson of like a sugar cube and me. I'm not that. However, I can appreciate it. I can see its uh, contours and its defining features. So in the end, learn uh, the mechanical act of, of painting Find your tribe and embrace the world as it is, wholeheartedly. I think also one more thing is recognize that your path is your path and don't compare yourself to other people because <laughs> your time is your time and their time is their time. And you know, it's, I think it's, that's one thing that's hard to do. I think when, you're, when you see people rising and you're like struggling and you're just trying to get there, you have to recognize that your, your time is coming and just celebrate that person and their time and you focus on what your path is. Especially with a culture that is so obsessed with instant gratification. And so much of what it means to be a great pianist, um, Gladwell lived, uh, uh, what did he say, something about 10,000 hours, which is essentially equivalent to like eight or 10 years of like active study. And the idea that you would ten, spend 10,000 hours doing anything, um, it's kind of, beautiful and not up to the occasion that we live in because there are so many distractions. But I think that that ultimately is, is going to be um, uh, something that you will almost kind of buoy you against comparing yourself. There's something about being a really great concert pianist. You know, you, con a really great concert pianist doesn't have to think about where their fingers are going. They're not thinking about how to read the music. They're thinking about how to emote and how to make themselves come across. And so I, I do this like thought experiment myself sometimes. Like, would they be comparing themselves to the emotion that someone else's life has given, given rise to? No, they have to, the only wellspring that they have is the one that they have. And I think that's the, I think that the key toward self-confidence comes from mastery you have to be able to know that this much I know is true. Otherwise, you're just out here being like, well, well there's so many shiny things that, that might lead to something. Whereas if you have worked so hard towards building the foundation of something that clearly has a path towards some sort of um, recognition, that at least is some terra firma to hold on to. Um, the trouble now is that everything is just so uh, disposable. And that's the opposite of what a, an oil painting is about. A portrait is about, is about you'll never be younger than this again, ever. Yeah, yeah that's no, so like, true. On this day, <laughs> yeah. I'm getting it down. Right? Yeah. And it's gonna last longer than your children will. Yeah. You know? It's the opposite of this social media culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we should, we should um, dance around. Yeah. So our final question. 
As someone who used to work here for a long time, spent countless evenings in this auditorium, I wanted to first thank you for giving us the most beautiful, thoughtful, and honest evening I can remember. Thank you. Secondly, I want to thank you both for giving such a great, permanent gift to America. And third, I thought about this for a very long time. I've always wondered what would happen if on the day you arrived to meet the Obamas, they switched. <laughs> and you were both faced with painting someone who was not the person you thought it was going to be. Have you subsequently ever envisioned, Amy, what your portrait of Baruch would look like? And Kehinde, what your portrait of Michelle would look like? Yeah, that would be cool. Freaky Friday. Well, when I went to the White House. Only Arnold Lehman can ask yeah, a question right? like that. <laughs> Um, when I showed up at the White House, I actually had a conversation with both of them. So I was somehow under the impression that I was going to be painting Michelle, but apparently Barack had questions for me too. Um, and the conversation started out with Michelle and I, and we were going back and forth, and then Barack was like, you know, so well, how would you paint me? And I was like, well. <laughs> um, and then Michelle was like, it's not your time, you know? <laughs> so, it, so the conversation never happened, but I was like, wow, I don't know, because I never thought about it. Like, I, I instantly attached myself to, to painting her. Um, but in my head, I said, I don't know, in dad jeans? Like, I was just, you know. <laughs> but, um, but I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I mean, yours obviously would have been amazing of Michelle. Um, what would, what would I, like, what would he have worn? You know? <laughs> Not my question. Um, so if there, if there was switcheroo, I would just say, you know, I would, I'd probably do what Amy did. I would probably try to go personal. But then also, like, you have to, okay, so there's different calculus for women in painting than men. So um, in the world of painting, women have been seen as possessions, as objects to be consumed, and or backdrop for powerful men. Mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the, uh, 16th all the way into like 19th century French and British painting, other colonial powers as well. But like most of that stuff is all about showing off powerful big boys and what the stuff that they own looks like. And rarely has it been a woman who occupies that space solidly. And I don't see, as this world and this country and this room rightly does not see Michelle that way, because that's simply not her role. Her role is to be full force, a full front, full uh, engaging. I think I would probably have something that feels um, a little bit familiar from uh, a portrait of a man, but it probably would feel unfamiliar uh, looking at an oil painting from uh, from the past that way, mm -hmm. using the language of dominance and, and self uh, acceptance and the language of taking up space quite luxuriantly and feeling like I've been doing this for thousands of years. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is what um, a state of grace in painting looks like, and I, I don't see why not. Would you have given her a sword? I can't give you all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think we have concluded this beautiful conversation. Thank you so much, Amy Shell. <laughs> <laughs>